You know, in a time where fantasies become so, so bloated or so, so heavy that it's hard for you to kind of get into other series in between those because they're just so heavy, so epic, I have a solution for you guys. It's called the Rayer Revelations. Let's take a quick look. There are no honorable causes. There is no good or evil. Evil is only what we call those who oppose us. That's why you should not make vows. The moment that you do, fate starts conspiring to shove them down your throat. To know joy lies forever just beyond your reach, in a way, is a kind of torture. But you don't win battles with hate. Anger and hate can make you brave, make you strong, but they also make you stupid, and you end up tripping over your own two feet. Happiness comes from moving towards something. When you run away, oft times you bring your misery with you. Sometimes, the price of dreams is achieving them. Look at the swords he's carrying. A man wearing one, maybe he knows how to use it, maybe not. A man carries two, he probably don't know nothing about swords, but he wants you to think that he does. Ah, but a man carrying three swords, that's a lot of weight. No one's gonna haul that much steel around unless he makes a living using them. And it's not that we don't trust you, it's just that we've learned over the years that honor among nobles is usually inversely proportional to their rank. As a result, we prefer to rely to more concrete methods for motivations, such as self-preservation. When you expect nothing from the world, not the light of the sun, or the wet of the water, or the air to breathe, everything is a wonder, and every moment is a gift. Then living has no value. It's what you do with life that gives it worth. What is the advantage of fear or the benefit of regret or the bonus of granting misery a foothold even if death is embracing you? And you see there, that's the difference. I suffer a loss and people console me. Roy suffers a loss and whole towns evacuate. Hey, what's up, bookworms and potential heirs of Novron? Mike back today to do a little sales pitch for you. And this is for a series that I have grown to love over the last year and a half of reading it. These are the six novels published between 2008 and 2012. I'll talk, of course, about the Raira Revelations by Michael J. Sullivan. Now, like I said, six novels, but they're more commonly known now in these Orbit uh, double Double release, I guess you call it. Uh, the Omnibuses edition, where it puts the six into three. That's what they're more commonly known as now. But it was actually, uh, I guess the first one was actually published, and then the publisher kind of went under, and then he self-published the rest of them, and then got picked up, and has become a bigger name. Now, Michael J. Sullivan, I feel like this is a author who has had a lot of a success, but I still feel like it should be even more, because I feel like not, well, not, it doesn't feel like a lot of people have really, you know, look, he ain't hurting, okay? I mean, the guy is, just, I think he's putting out like his 14th, 15th book or something here soon. So the guy's not hurting. But it's one of those things, it's like, it takes a lot to get people to pick these up. But once they do, they absolutely fall in love with them. And that's what we're here to talk about, why this series has become so beloved. Those are not going to sit there, so I'm going to do this real fast. But uh, it was pretty much, um, I was kind of out of modern fantasy there for a couple of years. And I first started doing this channel. Uh, I never really meant to be like a fantasy channel per se. You know, I still like to focus on other things. I was really still just getting right back into reading Stephen King a lot. I just decided, hey, I'm going to do Wheel of Time. And then I started getting a lot of recommendations. And I opened up for a poll on my channel. What series would you guys like me to read? And Rayera won far and away. And that's how I kind of discovered the series. But uh, it, like I said, it's a series I feel like not enough people talk about. But it's just wonderful. And I want to kind of sell more people on giving this series a try. And that's what I always try to do with these Why You Should Read. There's stuff that I feel like is very, very approachable for any age, any kind of whatever genre you're kind of into. I feel like no matter what your deal is, these are things I think that you'll appreciate. And I'm here to talk about why. But let's do like we usually do, guys. And let's kick things off. We're talking about what is the series about. Now, this is going to be very, very vague because I don't want to spoil anything for you when I'm talking about books, uh, six book series here. 
Now we have Royce Melbourne. He's a skilled thief and his mercenary partner, Hadrian Blackwater. They make a profitable living carrying out dangerous assignments for conspiring nobles until they are hired to pilfer a famed sword. Now what appears to be just a simple job finds them framed for the murder of a king and trapped in a conspiracy that uncovers a plot far greater than the mere overthrow of a tiny kingdom. As war approaches, a desperate gamble behind enemy lines is their only chance at forming an alliance with the nations to the south. Meanwhile, unraveling the mysteries of Hadrian's past, may unravel everything that the duo has worked for, and Royce wonders if they are just pawns in an ancient wizard's bid for his own kind of power. And that takes us into Theft of Swords or the Crown Conspiracy, whichever order you're kind of reading this in. Or I guess what really what version you're reading this in, because I have the I have the individual ebooks, like as they were originally released, and then I got these uh, when I decided, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and read this. And because you know me guys, I have to have it on both hard copy and digital. Anyway, so like I said, very, very vague there because I don't want to tell you, obviously, things that happen as far as like, if I went to like the second volume there, I'm already spoiling things that happen for you. So things escalate quickly in this series, but escalate as we are, let's talk about what makes it good or bad. I want to start with the good and the good here, guys. It doesn't go any farther than Royce and Hadrian. You can't talk about the series without talking about the two leads of the series because they make it go. The chemistry between these two leads is the best that I have ever witnessed in fantasy. This is by far, without a doubt, my favorite one-two punch in any fantasy series that has ever been written. You love these characters so much. They are like the Butch and, Sand, Butch and Sundance of the fantasy genre. They're just so much fun to watch play off each other. They're very witty. They're very funny. But... When it comes nut cutting time, these guys get stuff done. And I think that's what makes them so likable. There's just these two rogues that you just kind of, they don't fall into all those kind of expectations you have for them. Sometimes they do, but they never feel forced or you never feel cheated by this. They're just so good. They play off of each other so well. And I mean, it's literally not even a third through the first book where you're already like, I can sense the friendship, the brotherhood, the camaraderie between these two guys, and you just want to be a part of it. You love whenever those two are together. Like they have their, they're separate, they have their own storylines. It's pretty good when they're together. Man, the books just soar. They're fantastic, and you want to see more of their adventures. Uh, but you, know, you got Hadrian, who is kind of like the baddest swordsman in the land. But Royce is the way more scary one. It's it's kind of one of those things you have to read to discover why he's like this. But really, it's it's almost like that kind of like thing that like you have like the myth of like you know the good cop, bad cop, and then you have like the bad cop, worst cop. When it comes to like parents, it's like your mother would always be like, "Look, you know that I can discipline you, but don't make me tell your father." That's kind of how it is with Royce. It's like you know, if you're getting to the point where uh, Hadrian can't take care of you with a with his charm and his three swords, yes, three swords. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, you don't want Royce coming to knock him because. That guy is like, you know, Darth Vader, basically, when you push him the wrong way. But again, that never makes him less likable of a character. It actually is one of those things that kind of endears him to the reader. And you'll see what I mean. But it isn't just about these two. Yes, they are the main attraction here, but they have a fantastic supporting cast that rotates through these six books. There's characters in the first book that you might not see again for until book five or book six, but you know, you remember who they are right away because they were so memorable that first time around. So not every book has the same cast, but a lot of those kind of had their culmination here in the end of this series. And uh, it's just so satisfying. It really is. But I, I think what makes it good is that it has a smaller cast and like some of your most of your epic fantasy you know you're not memorizing 50 to 75 to hundreds of names with this book you can kind of get your main core cast and then everyone else just kind of comes and goes in a way that makes it feel like a living breathing world but you don't have to memorize you know the 14th character and what they did in you know chapter three of book number two when you get to book five you don't have to do that and i think that kind of makes it a little easier in that regard but again when i say these books are easy reads i never mean that in a derogatory way it's in a very enjoyable way you know sometimes you get these books that got you know 300 pages and you still don't know what's going on this you know what's going on right away and the way he does his world building is he kind of just adds it in as it goes along in a way that makes sense, in a way that's very approachable for any you know level of reader that you are. You'll have a good time with the way that he creates this world. But you got Myron, you got Arista, Thrace, Magnus, uh, Ulrich, the Pickerings, they all 
have great arcs in this. It isn't just about Royce and Hadrian. That's the kind of thing I got to touch on here is don't worry, this isn't just a boys club. You hear me talk about Royce and Hadrian. There are great, great female characters in this. And I think Arista and Thrace have some of the best arcs maybe in the entire book. They really do. Their characters from book one compared to their characters of book six, completely different. Amazing, amazing character arcs. Kind of makes me think of like Cordelia from Buffy and Angel, if you guys ever kind of watched that there. But kind of like, it's like you look at where she was that first season of Buffy and where she was the last season she was on Angel. And I was like, that's a completely different character. That's kind of how I feel about Arista in this. So, of course, you know, Charisma Carpenter, that was Arista in my head. But, you know, again, I, I, I like that the, he doesn't really struggle too much with the exposition. I, I, I never have a part where I feel like, okay, I've got to get out the notebook. I've got to, got to start taking notes to remember all this history, all these factions, all these kingdoms, all these people, all this hierarchy. You never really have that. If you want to do that, you can. It's there. You can do that. But there's never a part where you're like, I don't know who this character is. I don't know why they're doing this. I don't know who I'm supposed to be rooting for, that kind of thing. You, you very, very clearly know who the good guys and the bad guys are in this. It's it's definitely a, a not your, your morally gray characters kind of thing that you usually have. Now, Royce and Hadrian have done some stuff and it's going to come up and they do some things. Sometimes you might be like, ooh, that's, that's kind of dark. So I won't say that like this is just straight white characters versus black characters when it comes to morals. But I will say that uh, there are some things there where you never have a problem realizing who's on the side of good. They might do some questionable things. But this isn't grimdark, guys. This is very much traditional fantasy in a good way. I, I think that, uh, again, that is something that kind of gets frowned upon when you talk about modern fantasy now is when you say this is traditional fantasy and it's not grimdark dark it's not gritty or anything like that i think people just assume that means it's childish and it's definitely not i think any age and any uh, a lover of fantasy is going to be able to enjoy this series it, I, I look at it almost like a like a, a terry brooks kind of way not in a derivative of lord of the rings way but like in that it's traditional fantasy but it feels like it's traditional fantasy for the modern era and i know that that sounds like i'm trying to have my cake and eat it too but you will understand when you read it guy yes it has those tropes those things that people consider a negative connotation towards fantasy no it has those tropes that makes you remember why you love this genre in the first place. You know, you have your elves, you have your dwarves, you have your mythical beasts, you have your impenetrable tower, those kinds of things. You have all the stuff there, and it never, ever feels like a bad thing. So uh, I think I like also that it feels serialized, but they, they, they also kind of feel almost standalone -ish. It's like, I have separated these six books over the last year and a half. I kind of look at them as like comfort food uh, between uh, real heavy Sam Fancy, like reading Malazan right now and reading per, uh, Wintertide and Persepolis. That's books five and six of this. Uh, in between those has helped me immensely. It's, it's such a good... It's like a comfortable pair of pants you put on. And just remember, this is why I love fantasy. It doesn't have to make my brain hurt to read it. That doesn't make it a bad thing, guys. I know people, like, when you hear, hear, oh, they're quick, easy reads, people assume that means, oh, well, they're just not intelligent. That's not the case here at all. These are very intelligently written books. Fun dialogue, witty humor. Uh, it really, to me, like I said, with the, with the, the serialized thing, is it feels like about like six seasons of TV, where you have each season kind of feels like its own story arc. But you have the one main arc that goes across the whole series. So I, I know that that sounds, again, like you're trying to have it both ways. But you just you got to get to it to understand what I mean. But the thing about it is it has a tight, focused story that had a planned beginning, middle, and end from go. He wrote this series all the way through before he released it. So he knew where he was going with it. And it shows here because his story never once takes its eye off the ball. And I, I, I don't want to say that there's no filler because there might be some things that you might say, oh, well, you know, that would really work for me. Like there's a part in book four. Uh, it didn't really work for me that much, but that's really a thing with me. It's going to kind of depend on you because it has so many subgenres within the genre. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, but uh, there's one thing that really bothers me about fantasy is I'm not crazy about, uh, you know, nautical stuff, stuff out in the ocean, you know, on a boat for a long period of time. That, that's one of the kind of things that bothers me about fantasy. I'm just not 
able to get into that. I call it my Moby Dick PTSD. I don't know. I was forced to read Moby Dick, and now it's anything that takes place on a boat. It's a struggle for me to read. But I never felt like it dragged the series down kind of thing. That's just more of a, a something that kind of bothers me. But uh, again, like I said, I think this is approachable for any age. And if this is where someone wants to start with fantasy, I think it's a dang good place that they could start. Absolutely. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to start because this doesn't feel like a bleak and hopeless world. This doesn't feel like it's going to scar your mind for, you know, for reading things that you feel like you shouldn't be reading at a certain age or something like that. Again, feels like a modern age throwback to classic fantasy and, and almost in like a, a John Gwynn way. Not quite as violent as John Gwynn. There's violence in here, but I, I think in that very much in that writing style about how we're not going to give you so much exposition that you feel like you're losing pace of what the characters are just for sake of world building. You never, ever stop developing these characters along the way and your world continues to get bigger as you go along and i think it's just a a great great way to go about things now for the bad things here i think if you read mostly adult fantasy pretty much everything is blood and guts and sex and violence and things like that and there are no good guys no bad guys and this might seem a little too pg for you uh almost in like a brandon sanderson kind of way I don't consider that a bad thing. I'm just telling you that might be a bad thing for you. If this is something you have, you might feel like yes, this is for like a teenagers kind of kind of kind of kind of age range. But it's it's like a like a Marvel movie in that like you any age can enjoy it. Sure, it's that's the target demo, but any age can enjoy it. Uh, so I, I think that might be a bad thing for you. Just really depends on your 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 reading level, I guess. Uh, me, I'm reading it like I said at the same time as Malazan, which I consider like the PhD of fantasy. And I have plenty of room for something like this. I, I love it. I love it. But I, I think you probably you won't be blown away by his pros. I wouldn't call it lackluster or anything. Again, guys, I'm not a pro snob. But don't go into this expecting, you know, like Patrick Rothfuss. It's nothing like that. Uh, I, I feel like he makes sure that it's approachable for any age, really. So he isn't going to be hitting you with those $25 words when a $10 word will work. You know, so uh, th again, uh, if you're a pro snob, you might think, oh, it's, it's kind of vanilla. I, I don't know. I think it's fine with me. It's all about the characters and the characters in the shine. So the prose doesn't bother me whatsoever. But it might get you. And some of the villains are kind of uh, mustache twirling. They're bad just for bad sake. There's no real reason why they should be bad. So again, some of those fantasy tropes might bother you. And so I want to bring them up. But let's get into why you should read it, guys. Because that is why we're here, right? So say you're reading something really, really heavy. And you need a break between those. Like I said, perfect comfort food. These will be just what you're looking for to kind of cleanse the palate in like that Dresden Files kind of way. How you got, you've got a core cast, but you don't have to, you know, make so much room inside your head for this whole new thing. You don't need a new filing cabinet up there. Just a file folder, I think, will do. I'm the most likable lead character duo that I've ever seen in fantasy. I can't state that enough. Royce and Hadrian, I challenge you not to fall in love with these two characters. Uh, I love that there's so many themes in this book. There's themes of friendship, of love, of betrayal, sacrifice, uh, questioning faith, things like that. You got your, you know, your prophecies. You got all of that stuff that you kind of expect in a fantasy story, but it really the themes of all that stuff is just never heavy-handed, but it's very much at the forefront. Uh, it's never dark just for dark's sake. There are sad moments, but again, this world doesn't feel hopeless. You have characters trying to do good and they have a lot of victories they have defeats but they have a lot of victories too so you never ever feel hopeless there are true fist pumping moments that are so satisfying in this uh, i just got one at the beginning of Perceptiquist, that's book six. There was one in the chapter two of this that was so awesome. It's like if this was a movie theater, the, the, they would be standing ovation. It was so good. And it's just, there's several moments like that where it's just like you're, as you're reading, you're like, oh, I wish this had, oh my God, it's going to happen. Yes. And it's so good to read. It's never predictable, but it's sometimes it's like, hey, I'm going to give the reader what they want every once in a while. And that's never a bad thing. But again, I think each of these six books kind of has like a different theme to it. So you kind of have everything. You got your heist. You got your, you know, breaking into an impenetrable fortress. You got your coming of age. You got the prophecy. You got the traveling party, the quest for a legendary relic, uh, destiny, you know, fate versus free will. All of those things that we've come to love about fantasy. They are all here and they're all done so, so well and with a lot of care. I do have a couple of final thoughts here before I, I go. I didn't know that this was something that I needed until I read it. Uh, it was at a time where I was reading, you know, Will of Time, 
And I just thought, okay, um, do I really want to start another fantasy series? Uh, I was on a cruise and I had the first book, Theft of Swords, the first two pack, I guess you'd say. And I read both of those on that cruise and I just absolutely fell in love. I was like, this is just what I needed, you know, nev nothing too heavy, nothing that I could consider like, you know, I could close my eyes and make it through it. Just a fun adventure story. That's what I wanted and that's what it gave me. And like I said, it kind of took me back to my youth of uh, reading uh, Terry Brooks for the first time. And I know a lot of you guys, you hear Terry Brooks and you think, oh God. Terry Brooks, pretty much, in my opinion, I've talked about it on the channel. I feel like Terry Brooks, he brought back the fantasy genre in the 1980s. So I'm looking at it like that. When I was a preteen and I read Shannara for the first time, yes, this is what it kind of made me feel like. Now, like this is, I remember now why I love fantasy. And this really does that quite a bit. Um, it, while it's an easy read, I never think that it feels lazy. Uh, I could never, ever accuse it of that. The big moments are earned, and man, do they hit hard. Both the good and the bad, they are earned, and they're so, so good, so satisfying. I feel like he gives you just enough answers to keep you interested, to keep going, but never gives you the big answers to where you're like, ah, well, I don't really need to know anything else. Uh, it never really bogs you down. That's something I can't say enough about, that feeling of never just feeling like the world building, the lore, the characters are just too much. I, I, I just, like, I don't want to put in the effort to do this and, and look guys i just i can't wait to continue this universe you know this is these six books and then there's uh he's got a, a a prequel series about certain characters that um he's i believe he's writing book number five of that right now and then he has a completed prequel series to that prequel series just like three thousand years before they called the legend of the first empire and that's complete so i mean there's plenty of stuff to go around and now i think he's working on a new trilogy right now it takes place somewhere else in that timeline so he's going to continue to keep building this world and it just sounds like it's massive and i can't wait to dip in and see how well he can carry a series without a Royce and a Hadrian. That's what I'm really interested to see. That's where I will decide, you know, how big of a fan of Michael J. Sullivan I am, as opposed to just how big of a fan of Rayer I am. We're going to get into uh, in those things when I, I get there. But uh, check out my video tomorrow. I will be talking with Michael J. Sullivan about the series, and it will be non-spoiler. So if you guys want to know more about the series, you can jump on there. And guys, that's really why I think you should read this. It's a great, great time. I think you're going to have a lot of fun. And again, guys. Easy doesn't mean that uh, it's it's not good. You know, I, it's, it's not worth your time. It's absolutely worth your time. You can go to his website. You can buy his books off there. Uh, I'll link it below. Uh, he signs everything. It's, it's, it's worth your time, guys. It really, really is. I really can't say much more than that besides it's just you're going to enjoy it. And then that's all I can say. That's the best sales pitch that I can give it. You're going to enjoy this. You're going to have no regrets. And I can't wait for you guys to check it out. So have you read Rider Revelations, guys? Drop in the comments and let me know. Are you going to give it a shot? Let me know and I will talk to you in the comments.